if you have the motivation to get up and face whatever tomorrow holds, if you were asked to select two words on which you could anchor your life to whether whatever hand you're dealt, what were those two words be? I don't know how you would answer that question, but I want to share with you how I believe a major biblical character in the book of Genesis would answer that question. I know how the writer, the inspired writer of the book of beginnings answered it. And the answer is found in Genesis 45 and Genesis chapter 50. But I want to ask you to turn with me to the beginning of the story, which begins in Genesis 37. So let's open our Bibles there this morning as we continue our study through the book of Beginnings. We're going to study the life this morning of a very familiar man of faith. His name is Joseph. He's an incredible man of faith. But try not to mentally coast through the story just because you know the ending. In fact, I want to ask you to try to put the ending out of your mind right now and just live with him day by day. He is an incredible man of faith. In fact, his faith is day by day. He doesn't have the advantage that you and I have of the written Word or the knowledge of the Messiah or the empty tomb. And yet his faith is a Hall of Fame caliber level according to Hebrews chapter 11. But make sure you understand this. His personal faith did not come easy. And listen closely, it never does. It never does. Our faith is often refined by the fiery trials of life. Our faith comes daily as we navigate through the difficult and often messed up circumstances in life. This man's just trying to make God-honoring choices day after day after day. And many of you know that Joseph was born into an extremely dysfunctional family. The old adage is true, you can choose your friends but not your family. And you cannot choose nor control their level of functionality. Today we hear the word dysfunctional very frequently. Webster says that it means impaired. It means abnormal. It means that something is not working as it should. It's not functioning like it's supposed to function. If we cloak that word in spiritual language, it means that someone is not functioning like God originally created that person to function. So think about Joseph's family for just a moment. His father had four wives. You think your family's got problems. It means that Joseph has three stepmothers. He's got ten older stepbrothers and one older stepsister. Families can get really messed up, can't they? And lives, individual lives, can get really messed up. And only God can unscramble and help us unravel some of them. Because of the choice and the choices that his father made, Joseph will have to deal with the ramifications of those choices 
all his life and work through them. Listen to how one modern day family got messed up because of the choices that two people made. I read this article recently about Bill Baker of London, England, age 76, who married a lady by the name of Edna Harvey. She happened to be Bill Baker's granddaughter's husband's mother. Yeah, some of you are already shaking your head. Can you imagine? That's where, according to his granddaughter, things got very tangled up. She said, and I quote, My new mother-in-law is now my step-grandmother, and my grandfather is now my step-father-in-law, and my own mother is now my sister-in-law, and my brother is now my nephew. But even crazier than all of that, I'm now married to my uncle and my own children are also my cousins. Now that's, that's messed up, isn't it? I mean, that's messed up. Joseph's father puts one of those four wives up on a pedestal. And all of the family, that's all the other wives, and all the children know it. And then because Joseph is the son of that favorite wife, and because Joseph is the son of his father's old age, Joseph's put on the pedestal. He didn't choose to be up there. It just happens. But because it happens, there are a lot of family problems that ensue. His family, his blended family, is one of anger and resentment and envy and jealousy and deceit and manipulation and lust and sin and any other word you want to put in that sentence. He didn't ask for these problems, but he's right in the middle of them. We're told in chapter 37 here that when he was 17 years old, his father sent him to check on his older brothers who were tending their flocks near Shechem, which was about 20 miles away. Three times in Genesis 37, the Bible tells us that his brothers hated him. When they saw him coming, his brothers plot to kill him. They mock him by saying, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's throw him in one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. We'll see what comes of his dreams. Again, he's in a pit. And against his brother's pleas, there he is at the bottom of this deep cistern. And it had to hurt to be thrown down into this pit, both physically and emotionally. And sadly, sometimes family members do that to one another. Sometimes they hurt each other unintentionally. And I pray that if we're people who've been hurt by the choices, decisions, actions of a family member, and it's been unintentional that we'll rise above it and be able to work through it and move forward. Sometimes our hurt comes by people who intentionally, they know what they're doing. And they hurt us nevertheless. Which one stings a little deeper? It's the one that's intentional, isn't it? Joseph's in this pit because his brothers calculated and premeditated the action to put him there. There are all kinds of pits in life. There are emotional pits that people find themselves in and there are deep, physical pits that many of our loved ones are having to go through 
and it affects our family life, and there are deep mental pits of confusion and depression that many people find themselves in. Can you imagine what all is racing through Joseph's mind as he's down in this physical pit? And he, as he looks up and he sees the deep flaming anger in the eyes of his own brothers. Can you imagine what flies through his mind as he hears the harsh words that come from his own flesh and blood? A caravan of Ishmaelite merchants happened to be traveling by, and I use that word happen that's in this story loosely. A band of Ishmaelite merchants happened to walk by. Because back in Genesis 15, 13, God tells Abram that his descendants will one day be strangers in a country that's not their own. And they'll be enslaved there and mistreated down in this foreign country for 400 years. And then God says, I will punish that nation and in the fourth generation, I'll bring your descendants out and I'll lead them back here. Listen closely. Here's the reason why God is going to lead them down there. Let them stay 400 years and then lead them back to this very land. It's Genesis 15, 16. I'll lead them back here. Why? Because the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. There are three fascinating points to me about that passage. First of all, God knew that He was going to use the life of Joseph to accomplish His will. Even though Joseph could not see God at work. And secondly, Joseph had to be mulling over in his mind the phrase in an old song that we sing, could this be part of the plan? He doesn't have a clue that it's all part of God's plan, but God's going to use it and He's going to work in it. So the second lesson that's fascinating to me is this. God works in horrible, painful, messed up situations even though we may be totally unaware of His presence, much less His work. And the third thing that is fascinating to me about this part of the story is this. The eventual conquest of the promised land that years later will be led by Joshua. You remember how Joshua said, choose who you're going to serve in the land of the Amorites in whose land we now dwell? The eventual conquest of the promised land led by Joshua, was initially brought about not only to bring Jesus into this world and to fulfill all the prophecies about the Messiah, but it was also to bring judgment upon the people of Canaan who for centuries were filled with ungodliness and wickedness. We very rarely ever talk about the judgment of God. But that's fascinating to me. And so that's why years later God will want His people when they finally, led by Joshua, enter into the land to drive them all out. He's given them 400 years to turn their situation around. And they're more hard-hearted at that point than they were at this point 400 years earlier. But that's down the road in history. Let's go back to this pit. This caravan of Ishmaelite merchants come by and their brothers get into a discussion with them about what to do with their younger brother. One tongue-in-cheek writer said this is typical of what people often do about the lives of people they see who they know are in the pits. The author put it this way. 
The subjective person comes by and says, I feel for you down in the pit. The objective person comes by and says, it's logical that you would fall into a pit. A Pharisee comes by and he mutters, only bad people fall in the pit. A mathematician comes by, he starts calculating how far the fall is. A news reporter comes by and says, can I get an exclusive story on why you're in the pit? A pity party man comes by and says, you had not seen nothing until you see the pit I've been in. The pessimist comes by and he says, your life's going to get worse now that you are in a pit. I'll ask, what's your attitude? about the pit that you are in or the pit that your loved one is in. What Joseph needs is somebody to come by and be his friend and help rescue him or at least get there with him and just sit beside him and be his friend. Much less stand up to his brothers and say this is not the way God wants it to be. His brothers discuss at length what to do with him. They callously choose to sell him. You know the story how they take his multi-colored coat and rip it up, stain it in animal's blood, take it to their father and watch him grieve himself to his grave over what they know is a lie. I used to show a movie to my psychology class at my high school in Georgia and the classic line in it we would use as a springboard to our discussion on human behavior. And that line was this, why are people so cruel? Turn with me to chapter 39. Joseph ends up in Egypt, another country, and sadly he's sold again. One of King Pharaoh's officials named Potiphar purchased Joseph. I can't imagine what all he's gone through, all that's going through his mind. But if you mark in your Bibles, let me ask you to mark the phrase in verses 2 and 3 that says the Lord was with Joseph says it again when his master saw that the Lord was with him. People notice us, don't they? And have you ever seen people whom you knew the Lord was with them? One day, Potiphar's wife boldly tries to seduce this handsome young man who works in her home. That's how affairs often begin. Two people are frequently in close proximity to each other. And innocent conversations occur frequently and over time one becomes attracted to the other one and one gets bolder and bolder in the personal things they share and say to the other one. Things escalate mentally and verbally, emotionally, unless one of them has the self-control and the God-focused mentality and courage that Joseph had they all eventually cave in. Verse 7 says that this lady, this married lady, plainly stated her intentions. And verse 10 says that it happens day after day after day. But this young man in a foreign country been sold twice, now presented with the ultimate challenge of self-control, respects his God respects her soul, respects his body, respects her body, and respects his master, the one who bought him. So when she grabs hold of Joseph's tunic and pulls him close to her body and boldly states her intentions again, He gets out of her physical grasp and he flees. Runs out of the house. And the fury of an ungodly scorned woman can be vengeful. 
And so she lies about Joseph, just like his brothers had lied to him. She too deceives her husband at Joseph's expense, and he's thrown into prison. But what's his attitude? He ends up now in prison in a foreign country, been lied about twice, sold twice, and he's just trying to do what's right. Even though he's in prison, like the Apostle Paul will later on, he still looks at it as an opportunity to minister to others. And three blessings occur because of that. One is that ministering to others, even while he's in prison, keeps him from wallowing in self-pity. And that's very, very important. And secondly, it will ultimately lead to his deliverance. And thirdly, you can mark the end of verse 20 and 21. The Bible inserts this phrase again. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. We've just mentioned that phrase. Verse 23 says, The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Now quickly turn with me to chapter 41. After two years of prison confinement, Joseph was summoned to stand before the Egyptian king Pharaoh, who was troubled by the dreams that he was having, being kind to a cupbearer a couple years ago, will now pay dividends for Joseph. The king's cupbearer has an aha moment and remembers back to the time when he too was in prison and had a Hebrew cellmate interpret his dreams. And he shares the news with the king. Look at verse 16. Pharaoh summons Joseph into his presence. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one could interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can now hear a dream and interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Here's our lesson this morning. Whatever you are dealing with in life, the two words that change everything are these. Are you ready? But God. But God. I can't do it, Joseph said, but God can. I can't fix this situation, but God can help me through it. I can't get up myself out of the hole that I've been put in, but God can lead me through and lift me up and put me on higher ground. I can't help all that's going on in my life, within my family, but God can help me. I can't grow this church or help this church change for the better, but God can. Do you know how unusual that mindset really is? But God. Now look at the response of Pharaoh. It's in verse 38. Can He looks around to his court and he says, Can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the Spirit of God? I hope that's what's being said about us here at Cross Point. That people are seeing our faith into action and therefore they're seeing God. God works through Joseph and Joseph tells the king what's going to happen in the future and the king puts him in charge of using his skills to prepare the country for the horrible times that lie ahead. Turn with me to Genesis 45 and we'll wrap this lesson up. When the seven years of famine was so severe that it affected the entire world, that famine reaches back down to Joseph's family back in Canaan. 
And Joseph's father, who thinks his son is dead, wants to provide for his family. And when he gets desperate, the last thing to do is send his other sons down to Egypt to buy grain. You remember the story how they end up standing before their brother whom they once sold, but they do not recognize him. That brings us to our text. And let me ask you again to look for the two words that change everything. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers weren't able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives, you ought to mark that, that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there'll be not plowing or reaping. But God, there it is, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by that great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, there it is again, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord to the entire household and ruler of Egypt. Now hurry back. Get my father. Bring our families. And let's come so that we can be reunited and reconciled once more. Here's our lesson this morning. God is in the business of reconciliation. He wants us all to be reconciled to himself and reconciled to each other. He wants to forgive us. He wants us to forgive others. You can write it in the margin of your Bible here, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following, where Paul challenges the church at Corinth to be reconciled to God because God has given all of us the ministry of reconciliation. God has reconciled all things by His sinless Son so that He does not count our sins against us. And when we embrace the Christ and are a new creation, not only are all things passed away and everything's made new, but we are now reconciled back to God And we become, as 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, ambassadors for Christ. People who represent this grace of God that's been extended to us. And Paul says, that's the appeal I'm making to you. I want to close this morning by sharing with you six reconciliation principles that we learn from this story of Joseph with his brothers. Here they are. If you need to be reconciled to God or to someone else, first of all, involve only those who need to be involved in the situation. And secondly, like Joseph, allow yourself the freedom to cry and to share tears and weep. It's cleansing about the things that you've been through the things that others have done to you, the hurt that they've caused or you've caused or on and on. It's okay to get it out and to get it on the table and to cry. And so thirdly, according to verse 3, find the courage through God's strength to bring issues out of the darkness by speaking the truth in love and then be willing to give and receive grace and forgiveness, which is exactly what Joseph did to his brothers. I believe that two of the primary causes of emotional stress are the failure to forgive and the failure to receive forgiveness. And then reaffirm your love to the people who've hurt you. And remember 
that the two key words that change everything. They change your outlook. They change oftentimes the relationship. Those two words are these, but God. But God. And you remember the powerful line at the end of the book where Joseph recounting the story again after his father has now come to Egypt, lived and passed, his brothers are now terrified that this reconciliation is not genuine. And Joseph tells them again, what you did to me, you intended it for evil. Can you finish the rest of it? But God, but God intended all of this for good. Would you bow with me please? Dear Father, we acknowledge that some situations are just almost impossible for us to unwind and unravel. But you, but you can do immeasurably more than we asked or imagined. We thank you for this story, for preserving these 14 chapters out of the 50 in the book of beginnings on this one story to help us see you. And we pray that our lives will just totally be dependent upon you and that we will be ministers of reconciliation regardless of what hand we're dealt or what happens to us or how people respond. We ask you to help us to walk in harmony with your will and hold on to this phrase we've talked about, that it's all about you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If your life is full of problems right now, if you... Your life's messed up. If you find yourself in a deep pit emotionally, physically, spiritually, then this lesson's been for you. And the invitation this morning will be for you. If you need to, to find the will of God or to step out and step into the will of God or to be covered by the will of God, and just claim it, not knowing how things are going to turn out, but knowing where your heart is, a heart that's like Joseph's. If you need the Lord this morning, if you need God, His Son, who through His outstretched deeds on the cross made reconciliation possible for you, then we encourage you to come to Him.